Psalm 35, 8, 18 says, I will give you thanks in the great assembly among the, the throngs. I will praise you. Psalm 69, 30 says, I will praise God's name in song and glorify him with thanksgiving. I will, I will praise you. I will. Let it be that choice you choose this morning to praise him and to thank him with your lips. It's wonderful to have a thankfulness in your heart, yes. And it's wonderful to th have a thankfulness in your mind, yes. But to verbally, to verbalize and say thank you. We will thank you this morning, God. We will praise you this morning. Hallelujah. Because you are so, so worthy. How many are thankful in the house this morning? Well, let's sing a praise unto our God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
in the house. And we burn calories. Hello. Yes. But it is so awesome to worship in the house of the Lord in unity with the same mind and the same heart of gratitude for our God. Don't let it be that somebody has to encourage you or make you want to worship and thank him. Let it come from a place of you knowing who he is, how he has been, what he has done, what, has he, what he's allowed, doors that he's closed. It's all him. We thank you, God. Hallelujah.
have a praise on your lips, speak it out to him this morning. When Martha and Mary were preparing for Jesus to come into their home, and Martha was so busy and so occupied trying to prepare for his visit, which was really a beautiful action, but it wasn't what Jesus was seeking. He wasn't seeking her hand of service, but that was the moment that Jesus was seeking her heart. got it right and when he walks into the house and begins to speak nothing else mattered nothing else mattered when the presence of the Lord is there and then you can be at his feet your heart just wants to connect with his and you want to receive and you want to hear what he has for when we have these moments when we know the presence of the Lord doesn't ever go away, He's always present, He's everywhere. But when you're in a space and in a time when you recognize that He's just big and heavy, His Spirit is heavy in the place, don't allow for other things to get in the way, but let your heart connect with His and begin to hear what He's speaking to you. And sit at his feet and be still before him. And say, Jesus, this time and this moment that has already been set apart for you, I want to give it all to you. As you minister to me, I want to minister to you. 
minister to you right back. And it's a beautiful exchange of an encounter with our Lord and with our Savior who loves us so much. And he has so much to give. And he looked at Mary and he says, you did it well. Nothing else mattered to her. It doesn't matter who was in the room. It doesn't matter what was happening. It didn't even matter what had happened before or what was going to happen later. But she took a hold of that moment. And she sat in his presence. So take a moment right now and just in the presence of the Lord. Seek his heart. Hear his voice. Hello, church family. Last Sunday, Pastor Mario discussed tithes and offering, and I just wanted to go ahead and add upon that and just expand a little bit more. As he discussed, when we do not participate in this part of worship, we are robbing God. And that is what the word tells us. And to just expand a little bit more, when we tithe, we are obeying a law that is stated in the word. When we don't do that, we risk our active citizenship in the kingdom. In the olden times, when you didn't give your tithe, when you didn't obey the laws, that was considered treason and punishment could be death. In the kingdom, we risk all the benefits of being a citizen of the kingdom of heaven if we don't participate in this act of worship. Not only are you robbing God, he doesn't need our money, but you're robbing God of that in the storehouse. You're also robbing him of your worship. Worship requires reverence. That's the part in the service where many of us are like, we're tired from jumping around and praising and worshiping for the first few songs. We kind of just sit down, start scrolling on our phone. I already gave my tithe. I don't have to worry about it. The king is still in the room. Requires reverence. In the olden times when the people would come to give their tithes, to give their offerings to the king, they couldn't go in without a uh, significant offering to give. The king's guards and servants would examine the gift to make sure it was worthy of being in the presence of the king. And they couldn't just go in and just be like, here, king, here's my tithes, here's my offering, here's my gift to you. They had to kneel before the king and show that reverence. And they would kneel, eyes down, and then offer up that gift. Let's keep that same level of reverence that we do during the songs where we're all crazy and jumping and dancing during tithes and offering. What if I told you your breakthrough was right there through your tithes and offerings? If you apply the law, the key of sowing and reaping. When we sow into the kingdom, we're believing that the God of multiplication will take whatever tithe, whatever offering we bring to his court and multiply it to meet the need that we have. Sowing and reaping. The Bible tells us that once we ask for something and we believe it, we've received it. So through tithes and offering, we're supposed to just praise and worship and just believe that we've received what we've sown for. So let's carry that reverence, that same thanksgiving, that praise through tithes and offering. Let's apply that law, let's apply that key and begin to see growth in our lives. Let's see blessings, breakthrough happen. So I challenge you this Sunday and every Sunday after, in your minds, change that mindset. Tithes and offering is still a part of worship. The king is in the room. I'm gonna show reverence. We don't have to be as choreographed as our dance team over here, but we still have to show that fear for God. Let's honor him through our tithes and offering. Over the last couple of weeks, we have changed up a little bit and kind of came off of directly preaching in Hebrews, but we still were talking about growth. It was talking about the, the growth that is needed um, for this time, for such a time like this. Allow me to speak on some certain conversations that I've had recently and conversations with, with men and conversations also with God. The other day, I put out a message to a small, two small groups of people, and I said, if 
what is the one thing that people struggle, or what is something that people struggle that if they knew what the kingdom principle was, they would be better if they would apply this thing? And one group was a group of men. Another group was a small group of women. So it's a small sample size of what it is. And the men almost unanimously said identity. If they knew what the kingdom spoke about identity, that would help them tremendously. Identity. The other group was a group of women, and they had more to say. Naturally, right? They said, <laughs> they said finances, relationships, and there was a third one. I forgot which one was it now. It'll come to me in a minute. But it was finances, relationships, and I'll look it up on my phone. But it was all the things... Because I got before God. The question was asked to me originally by another pastor. And I said, let me do a little survey of a couple people that I know. And I started to look at it, and I was like, why is it so different? The men almost 100%. It was identity, identity, identity. And the women were, were different with it. And I got before the Lord, and I was like, God, why is it this way? Why is it that they're saying this, and why is it? Oh, forgiveness was the third one for women. Forgiveness, finances, and relationships. Well, the forgiveness also comes in with the relationship piece. And I was like, why is this a struggle in these areas? And the Lord clearly spoke to me. He's like, because that's everything that was lost at the garden. Everything was directly tied to everything that we lost in the garden. We lost identity. We lost our resources or our finances. The garden was full of gold. Our resources were there. Our relationship was directly impacted the moment sin entered. Our relationship with God, even our relationship with, with, with the marriage. Adam and Eve, they started pointing fingers at each other immediately. Immediately. God said, Adam, what happened? He said, the woman you gave me. He blamed God for what God called good. He said it wasn't good for this man to be alone, and he gave him a help. And now he messed up, and now he's blaming God for the thing that he provided for him. So God provides good things. It is us, the way we perceive it, if it's going to be good in our lives or not. If you perceive God one way, why did Jesus say, who do you say I am? Because he needed to locate, how do you perceive me? Because the way you perceive me is what you're going to get out of me. Nicodemus came to him and said, Rabbi. Rabbi means teacher. So guess what Jesus did immediately after he called him Rabbi? He taught. People came up to him knowing that he was a healer. And when they encountered him, guess what they got? Their healing. So however you approach him, this is why he has so many names. And this is why it's so important for you to know those names so you know how to approach him. And what he can do. So all these things were lost in the garden. I'm setting you up for future messages. We're going to impact this in the next couple of weeks. Not starting today. I'm saying this so you guys can get ahead of it. Whenever there's a message that comes to the house, it's not just for the pastor to study it out. It's for all of us to go in together and know what the word is saying. When I come up here or whoever comes up here and starts to speak, it should be adding to what you already have. It should enhance what you're reading. It should cause a hunger in you to even get back into the Word and get more. Well, I didn't see it that way. Let me go in there. Let me see what revelation God is going to give me personally. How does this apply to me and my personal so that's coming up the line, what we lost in the garden. I think I'm going to title the message, Born Again for What? Why are we born again? Just because we don't want to go to hell? If that's your thought, then you're limit limiting yourself for what God wants to do in your life. That's basic, and that's just entry level. 
Getting saved is entry level, but why are you saved? Born again for what? It's coming. But for today, let's go to Hebrews. I'm going to try to wrap up Hebrews. Put the bookmark and I'm flipping pages. Let's go to chapter 10. There was a section there that we spoke with uh, another group about Melchizedek, and this is what I want you guys to take away from Melchizedek. If there's nothing else that you can take a- that you will take away from, is this: Melchizedek was a priest. Those I don't have time to break it all down, so those that weren't here, go back to our previous messages. Melchizedek was a priest that was identified who had no beginning and no end. So, in other words, his priesthood was an eternal priesthood; it was forever priesthood. How many know that after we leave this earth, we'll continue to live? We're eternal beings. Now, your residency depends on you. So it's an eternal priesthood. So Jesus did not come in the order of an earthly priesthood, like the Levitical priesthood, but he came under the order of Melchizedek because whatever Jesus does lasts forever. If you come under an earthly priesthood, that priesthood has an expiration date. But if you come under the priesthood of Jesus, it doesn't expire. So whatever Jesus does is set from the moment he did it forever. So I want you guys to take that, that you're under the priesthood of Jesus Christ. So whatever he did already for you will be there forever and ever and ever. Because what the earthly priesthood did was you had to keep coming back to them over and over and over again. Because before Jesus Christ, the way to remove sin was through animal sacrifice, and the priest was the one that had to do it for you. So you had to continue to visit the priest for those things, for the removal of sins. But Jesus, since he died in perfect, in perfectly, died the perfect death in the order of an eternal priest, his sacrifice. See, the earthly priest will take an animal and sacrifice it. Our eternal priest took himself. And allow himself to be the sacrifice. So when he died the perfect death, that means it lasts forever. There's no need to keep going back with your animal, with your sheep, and like, let's sacrifice this sheep again. I'm pretty sure the sheep was screaming hallelujah when that happened. So, verse 10, I mean, chapter 10 of Hebrews. So just remember that. That what Jesus did on the cross was good enough for all eternity. So there's no need to keep repeating the same actions that in your mind will cause Jesus to go back up on the cross. What I mean by that? Jesus is not getting back on the cross for something he already delivered you from. When he died on that cross and rose again, everything that was hindering you was broken. Everything that was stopping you, every sin, every dis- act of disobedience was now you were set free from it. And the only way that you can operate in sin again is if you intentionally decide to do it. If you intentionally think about it. If you intentionally Seek it out. But the Bible gives us the the priority. Seek first the kingdom. So if you're seeking the kingdom and his righteousness, which we heard this weekend, the two are twins. And you can't separate the two. It's the kingdom and righteousness. People want kingdom but without the righteousness. The righteousness is what keeps you in right position to receive what the kingdom has for you. So Jesus is not going to get back on the cross for you for the sin that he already removed from you. So this is why as believers, sometimes we struggle with sins and we're crying out to Jesus. Oh, Jesus, take this away from me. And Jesus saying, in order for me to take that away from you again, I have to get back on the cross. And that will, I'm not doing it, he says. The Bible shows us. It's like, no, he will not get back on that cross. 
and you wanting him to get back on the cross is saying the first time you did it wasn't good enough. Chapter 10, verse 1. For the law. Give me a second. I'm not stuck. I just want to. Go to chapter 8, verse 7. Somebody heard somebody say, yeah. Let's just go 8-1. Come on. Go 8-1. I'll try not to stop through. Now, this is the main point. So everything that we read in Hebrews up to this point, we walked through this in this church. We went from chapter 1 all the way to this point here. He's saying, so everything you read before, this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens. When we see he's seated at the right hand, that means he's seated in the position of authority. That's what right hand means. It's like you guys know the, the, the mobster movies. That's my right hand, man. That means he has authority. That's your guy. That's your right hand. All right. Verse 2. A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. See, there was an earthly tabernacle, but this tabernacle is in heaven. No man created this tabernacle just for every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifice. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also has something to offer. We just talked about it. The priest will offer the animal sacrifices. This one had something to offer. We're talking about Jesus. What did he have to offer? Talk to me. Don't let it say it was himself. I'm not trying to trick you guys. He offered himself. For if, we, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. And he, he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. Just for the sake of time, when you see a shadow, you're not actually seeing the physical object if you see my shadow you can't give a person the details of what i'm wearing if you only see the shadow you can't tell what color shirt the shadow has you can't tell what color shirt the person has you can't say anything about the actual physical attributes of the person just just what you see in that shadow it's an outline but it's not a clear picture so the old covenant was a outline and not a clear picture of exactly what Jesus was intending to do. So when the new covenant comes in, we no longer see the shadow. We see the manifestation of the kingdom here on earth. Are we good? All right, move down to verse 7. For it, for if that first covenant, we're talking about the Old Testament, had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second one. So the first covenant had faults in it. This is why we have a second covenant. There was a fault in the first one. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Through adoption, we're a part of these houses. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they did not continue in my covenant and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after the, those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. In those days, they had the tablets. They had all these laws. And God is saying, you don't have to run to these things and look them up to see if you're a law-abiding citizen. He is saying, no, all you have to know, it is now written in your hearts and written in your minds. How many ever felt conviction when they were doing something wrong? 
How many have felt wrong about doing something that felt right before? Because you went from the old covenant into the new covenant. In the old covenant, you had to study up on the law. And to be honest, not everybody was sitting there. Before you were saved, before you were born again, did you study the laws of God? No. You went according to your own feelings and what you desired and what made you feel good. But then you encountered the new. You encountered Jesus and you're born again and now he writes it in your heart. So the same thing that you used to do prior Christ doesn't feel good. And no one has to tell you. What felt good in one season now feels terrible. Because according to the earth, according to the world, that was okay. But according to his kingdom, that is no longer a good thing for you to do. And the beauty of it is this. He delivered you from it. So you don't have to run back to that. But if you identify with the world, you get worldly results. If you identify with your citizenship in heaven, you get heavenly results. All you have to do is look at your results and know where you stand. You don't need a psychic to tell you. You don't need a prophet to come. And you don't need anybody to tell you where you stand. Just look at your results. In other words, look at your fruit. All right. Verse 11. None of them shall teach. This is good right here. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. This might shake up some, some religious mindsets. It says, no one has to teach, know the Lord? Nope. You just have to display the Lord. Why did he say no one has to teach it? Because the laws, the covenant is written in your heart. So the way you walk, the way you operate, the way you present your kingdom, no one has to say, know the Lord. All they have to do is walk in their calling. And they will know that you of, are of the Lord. You guys with me? This is what the scripture is saying. We heard it this week and I was, I was so, so awesome. Pontius Pilate was Pilate that asked Jesus, are you telling the truth? Something like that. What is true? Anybody know what Je how Jesus answered that question? You cheating. You were there. Okay. He responded the same way you guys are responding right now. Silence. Pontius Pilate asked him other questions. Pastor Tony went into it and looked at it real quick. Jesus answered all the other questions. Then he says, what is truth? Jesus stood quiet. He turns around and tells the rest of the people, I find no fault in him. He didn't answer him what the truth was. He just remained in the truth. He remained in the truth. When something is truth, there's no explanation for it. You don't, have to, you don't have to work at it. You don't have to explain away. You don't have to reason with people to know what the truth is because the truth stands right there and it tells, it, it tells you I am true by saying nothing. A tree doesn't say, I'm a tree. You know it's a tree because it's standing in its position. It's standing where it needs to be. Now let me help you out. There's a difference between true and truth. This is revelation to me. There's a difference between true and truth. As soon as I finish preaching, I will be hungry. That is true. It is not truth. It is true. I'm hungry that moment. But the moment I get some food, I'm no longer hungry. So it wasn't truth. Because if it was truth, I remain physically hungry. That's with me. So your situation right now can be true. But if you add the truth of God behind it, that true will change. Listen to this. Your current true is a future lie. Ah, no, nah, no. Nah. Don't let me get more excited than you. I'm hungry right now. That is true. But the moment I eat, it is a lie now because I'm not hungry no more. 
So don't base your life on a true. Base your life on God's truth. You got to call it by not what is seen. You got to call it by what is not seen. You got to call it how God calls it, not how you call it. Correct. Truth is not conditional. It's never going to change. And the truth shall set you free. It is truth. It won't change. What did Jesus say? I am the truth. He won't change because he's in the order of Melchizedek, a priesthood that's forever, that cannot change. I got so much, guys. Verse 13. In that he says, a new covenant he has made the first obsolete. That what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. And the same thing should be happening in our lives. Our old ways, our old things should be vanishing away. Because we're in a new covenant with greater promises and greater abilities to hear from God. Let's go to chapter 10. Let's not go to chapter 10. Let's go to chapter 9. Stay in 9, go to verse 26. I'm just kidding. Go to verse 23. Yeah, I think I don't know what I'm doing, but. And you're right. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm relying on the Holy Spirit right now. He's bringing things to remembrance. Ever happened to you? He brings things to remembrance. 23. 9.23. Hebrews 9.23. Yeah, work with me. Come on. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of these things in the heavens should be purified with these, but heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true, but, in, but into heaven itself now up to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that we should offer himself often, as the high priest enter the most holy place every year with blood of another, and and he then would had would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He put away sin. I'm going to hurt some minds here today. Sin has been put away. The only way sin is in your life is if you pick it back up. It's been put away. You think Jesus struggled with sin? He knew his identity. He knew who he was. He knew his calling. He knew his purpose. When you know your calling, you know your purpose, and you have your identity in Christ, sin will not touch you because you won't go and pull it, pull it back out from where it was put away. Come on, Holy Ghost, help me out. 27. And it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. We talked about this earlier. He's not getting back on that cross. He died once to bear the sins of many. It is interesting. It doesn't say all. Because we say this, Christ died for all of us. He cries for all of those that receive him as Lord. All have the opportunity to be part of the many, but not all take that opportunity up. So, yes, he died for the whole. Listen, it says that he died for his government. For God so loved the world. You guys know the rest? He gave his only begotten son 
For God so loved the world, for God loved his government. In other words, he loved his kingdom so much that he needed his kingdom to enter back into the earth. That's what he died for. And he said, for those that receive this, for those that receive this, they'll become part of the many. It is available for the all, but it won't be accessed by all. That's what the word is saying. Because I don't want to say, oh, God didn't die for everybody. Yes, he did. But it's up to them to take up the promises that he has for them. He doesn't force what he did on the cross onto the people. Those who eagerly wait for him will appear. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, for those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin. Apart from sin for what? Salvation. Do you know you're supposed to work out your salvation? And so many times we've been taught that at the moment you receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you shall, you shall be saved. So the moment we receive him as Lord and Savior, the salvation process begins. You are saved, but now you have to work out your salvation. Because you are saved, but now you have to believe that you're saved. You are saved, but now you have to walk in salvation. You are saved, but you don't have the evidence that you're saved yet. So what happens a lot of times, and, and churches are guilty for this, that you're saved and we expect immediate results, but we forget the part that you're supposed to work this thing out. And a lot of times people will be like, but I thought you were saved. Yes, I'm saved. I just had a little mess up. I'm still working this thing out. But it's saying here, apart from sin. So God is trying to work that sin that you keep running back to out of you. But it won't work out of you unless you have a relationship with his word, a relationship with him. It will remain there because you don't know it's not supposed to be there. He will appear a second time apart from sin. It's about to get gooder. Let's go to 10 now. That's my guy right there. How many know what the wages of sins are? The wages of sin. Sin requires, sin demands death. It is law. Wherever there's sin, something has to die. Something has to die. When Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, what God said is, if you eat of this, you will die. So the moment they ate of the fruit, guess what happened? Death was introduced. Because of sin, death had to come in. They didn't die immediately. But spiritually, they were disconnected. They died spiritually. Now, in, in their own mind, their own thinking, they still knew some things about God, but the connection wasn't there. It wasn't flowing the way it was originally intended to. So eventually, Adam lived, what, over 900 years? Eventually, some of those things started to fade away because the connection wasn't the same. But now we're born into this world, this world of sin. We're born into that under Adam's fault. We're into this world, so we don't have the connection with God. But now we get saved, and we're working out salvation. So the more you work out your salvation and remain obedient, the clearer you should start hearing from God. Because what we're getting back to is Eden. See, Eden is not a physical place. Because if it were, people would be there now checking it out. See, the grave was a physical place. And people go there. It is amazing how people go to a place to see nothing. The grave's empty. You don't know. I've ruined the, the, the book for you if you haven't got to that part yet. The grave is empty. The tomb is empty. But nobody ever says, hey, let's go book a flight, a trip to Eden. Because Eden cannot be found. Because Eden was an atmosphere. Eden was a position. Eden was a place of delight and pleasure in the Lord. Eden was a place that, that as long as you remain there, you were in communication with God. That's why the moment they sinned, God had to kick them out of there. He had to kick them out of there because there was a tree called the tree of the of fruit, the fruit of life, the tree of life. 
And if they continue to eat of that tree, I hope I'm not losing anybody here. They were able to eat of this tree freely. And the moment they sinned, they still had the opportunity to go back to that tree. But God said, no, that tree, I am removing it because if you continue to eat of that tree, you'll continue to live in a sinful state. So God is so much smarter and so much greater than us, and this is a form of love and mercy. He goes, I can't allow you to continue to live in a fallen state because the tree will keep you alive and you continue sitting for for eternity future because that tree's roots are not here on the earth. That tree's roots are in heaven. I know for you guys, some of the, your mind is, is, is gone. It's tough. But I have to speak this way so you can grow up with it. Let's go here. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year. Thank God we're out of the law. I'm going to show you right here what, what, why we should be thankful. Make those who approach perfect. So it's saying that as long as you're under the law and bringing those sacrifices year after year after year after year, you will not be made perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. They say if the law was great, the old covenant, and you would bring animal sacrifices, if it was so good, then that animal sacrifice would have been good the first time you did it. Because they washed your sins away completely, and you wouldn't have to come year after year after year. Year after year after year. For then would they have not ceased to be offered. This is the part I love here. This is fresh revelation I got this morning. For the worshipers. You think we come here in the mornings and start worshiping just because we like singing? There is a key. From the kingdom, that when you become a worshiper, something starts to happen because you start to access something. Worship gives you access. Worship is not about your favorite song. Worship is not about just just saying some things or just coming together because you like music. Because the reality is, music is not worship. Music can be used for worship. It can be incorporated into your worship, but it is not worship. You can worship without singing. You can worship without words. But there is something that happens when a sound is made. For them would they have not ceased to be all. For the worshipers once purified, would have had no more conscious of sin. When I got the revelation, I thought you guys would throw chairs and run around. Because I've heard it say, we're always going to be sinners. And that makes me mad. You want to see me mad? Come with me with that conversation. And I don't get mad at the person. I get mad at the lie. Because if Jesus put sin away, why would I always be a sinner? Because if Jesus' sacrifice was good, what was the sacrifice for? For the sins of the world. So only through the old covenant will I have to continue to come back for the sin offering because I have not been made perfect. And when I mean perfect, take away the English thought of what perfect is. Perfect is right standing and right positioning. Because none of us are perfect according to the way you know perf- perfection. We've all come short of the glory. We've all fallen short. But I can be in right position. I can be in right position for the blessing. I can be in right position for the glory of the Lord to fall upon me. I can be in right position. And God is saying, that is Perfection. You being in the right place at the right time when I need you. That is perfection. And you know when is the right time to be in the perfect place? All the time. Because when you're placed, when you're in the right place all the time, you're not in time, you're in eternity. 
I hope your brains are blowing up right now. When I'm positioned in the right place all the time, I'm not in time. Or let me say, at the right, at the right moment. I'm not in time. I'm in eternity. Because God doesn't want you to be, okay, at 1030 every Sunday, be in right position. As soon as service is out, get out of that position. Adam was always in the right position before the fall. When God came in the evening, the cool of the evening, he didn't have to go look for Adam because Adam was already waiting for him. When Ad, whenever God came in, Adam already knew, oh, God's here. Here we go. Why? Because he was in the right place. But as soon as sin came in, that same God that he knew from the beginning came, and now he was afraid because he was in the wrong position. You ever been caught with the hand in the cookie jar? He said, no, I don't like cookies. But you ever been caught doing the wrong thing? You ever been caught speeding? Oh, no, no you, you're driving fast, and all of a sudden you see a cop, and you're like, you turn pale when you see that cop pull up behind you. Even if he doesn't pull you over, you're like, oh, because you were caught in the wrong position. But if you're in the right position, that hey, cop can come, whatever. You're like, whatever. Unless you have something in the car, that's not a position. Come on, let's reel it back in. For the worshipers, this is a key to the kingdom. There's so many keys in here. If you become a true worshiper, God is looking this day for people to worship him in spirit and in truth. Spirit and truth. So in spirit and in him, because in him there is truth. In right positioning. So when you worship, you're not here just to sing songs. You better make sure I'm in the right position to worship my God. Because when you're worshiping, for the worshipers once purified, once purified, would have no more conscience of sins. And the word says, ah, I'm getting revelation. The word says, renew your mind daily. So if you worship daily, it becomes a part of your renewing. Your mind gets renewed as you worship. Because when you start, when you become a worshiper, there's a difference between I'm worshiping and I'm a worshiper. That's a position I'm in. This is who I am. I am a worshiper. For the worshipers, once purified, I got to read it again, would have no more. You don't. How many here struggle with thoughts of sin? If you want to raise your hand, go ahead. But if you don't want to tell on yourself, it's okay. So increase your worship. And you won't. Listen. How can you do something if you're not thinking about it? If I'm not thinking about sin, guess where I'm going to land? Let me put it this way. If I'm thinking about sin, guess where I will land? Doing a sinful act. But if it's not even a thought, if sin is not even a thought, I'm not going to commit a sin. See, sins are predetermined. The sins that we commit are already a desire that we want already. We desire those things. And the Bible says to move away from the sin that easily entangles you. Okay. Okay. That easily entangles you. In other words, it's saying this thing doesn't even have to work hard to get you. Because you desire it. So if you desire worship and increase your worship, the thought of sin itself won't be there. So you can't come and tell me, we'll always be a sinner. Yes, you will be. Because there's a thought in your mind. I said this last week. I'm going to add to it today, and I'll finish. Joel, help him. If church is an option for you, meaning the gathering of the saints, if that's an option to you, the options to make it optional will increase. This is not an option for me. What I mean by that is, it's not even a thought. 
will I serve the Lord? I already made up my mind. Wherever he tells, whatever he tells me to do, wherever he sends me, yes, Lord. My answer is a yes before he even says it. So when God says, do not forsake the gathering of the saints, once I read that, there was no option to not be gathered with the saints. But the moment I make it an option, the options to make it optional increase. I'm going to get up in your house. It is Sunday. And family members you haven't seen in a long time come on that Sunday. Hey, we want to see you. We're going to the theme parks, Orlando. They want, that's what they want to do. We're going, we're going to go see the rat. Then we're going to Universal to see the cat. And all that. The cat's at Universal, right? The cat in the house. Cat in the house. Cat in the house. Cat in the hat. Mouse in the house. Yeah, I, I came in at 2.30 in this morning. I did get a nap, though. So instead of saying, you know, but my family's here. I haven't seen them in a long time, so I'm going to go do that, and I'm going to make church optional. Guess what's going to happen next week? Another option. What if we flip the script and say, whoever it is, hey, I love you, and I want to go with you. I'm not saying it's bad to go but what if we flip the script and say, hey, why don't you come with me to church? And as soon as we're done, I'll go with you wherever you want to go. Except for a simple place. And if they say, well, no, we don't want to do this. Okay, well, I'm going to go to church. I'll catch up with you later. Because when you open up that option, the options will increase to make it optional. So the same thing happens with sin. Going back to this, will always be a sinner. No. No. Christ died for us not to be sinners. If y'all don't believe that, that's prove it to me through the word. He died for us not to be sinners. Does not mean when we won't have a moment, but I'm not thinking about having that moment. Because if I think about that moment, guess what? It is an option. And if it's an option, then the option to make it optional will come into my life. And then I have to struggle with the decision. Am I going to do this sin or walk away from it? And if I continue to open up those options, I will fall to sin. I will fall to sin. That same sin that Christ was on the cross for. I feel like I'm beating this, but it's, you need to hear this. Because it's saying right here, if I'm a worshiper, sin is not even a thought. And wherever your mind goes, your power flows. You will always land at the place that your mind takes you. And we have to make a decision and a commitment to live for Christ. And it has to be a commitment without conditions. I will serve the Lord as long as my bank account's okay. I will serve the Lord and go to the house of the Lord on Sunday as long as so-and-so doesn't come visit I'll come to church. I'll serve the Lord as long as it's not raining. You know, my hair can't get wet. I'll serve the Lord as long as. As long as you put a, as long as you put a condition. Did God put a condition for your salvation? Does God love us conditionally? unconditional in other words no matter what you do I'm still gonna love you so are we gonna serve the Lord in that form that no matter what happens I will continue 
to remain in the covenant without a condition. Now hear the Spirit of the Lord saying, open up my altar. Open up my altar. Because the altar is the place of sacrifice. And Jesus sacrificed himself on that cross. But he turns around and says that you ought to live your life as a living sacrifice. And the altar is where things die. In the altar nowadays, what is supposed to die on the altar? Yourself. Your ways of thinking. Your ways of, of conducting yourself in this life. Your personal knowledge. And you put it at the altar and it dies there in exchange for his kingdom. In exchange for his will. The altar is open for you to say, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven thy will be done in my life the way you see my life should go it's a dying to self in exchange for a greater a greater self it's an exchange of your image for his image and his likeness Now hear the Spirit of the Lord saying, the altar is open for those that want to commit without a condition. We have put conditions on how to serve God. And God is saying, I can't use you if I'm optional. The altar is open. For those to just get before the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. No strings attached. You're my only option. When Christ is your only option, the options to serve in start to increase who wants that in their life today the altar is open who's gonna say today enough is enough and say here I am Lord I'm not going to make an altar call and say, come down here, run down here. But the altar is open for you to have a personal time with God right now. If that's you today, I encourage you. I encourage you to walk out in faith.